Well, friends, it's good to be here with you again, and uh, we're making our way through the Ten Commandments, or the Tender Commandments, I like that. Found in Exodus 20, we've covered the first commandment, no gods and no other gods, and the second commandment, no graven images, and today we're going to consider the third commandment, and I'm going to read it to you, and it's going to be a little bit of a different translation than you're used to, found in the Common English Bible. Listen for God's word this morning. Do not use the Lord your God's name as if it were of no significance. The Lord won't forgive anyone who uses his name that way. This is the word of the Lord. You might be asking yourself, given where we are culturally, so is this really a big deal? Or as Aaron says, is this a big dang deal? <laughs> to consider that question, one has to begin at the beginning and say, why did God give this commandment in the first place? Does it mean that God is so bothered by cursing that he made it third on the list? Does it mean that God is so sacred that you contaminate his name when you slip on a banana peel or scrape your new brand new shoes and say an expletive? Probably not. So why the concern? And the answer lies in how the Israelites regarded names. For them, and many times as well, names meant identity. God's identity was liberator, source, sustainer, the beginning, the end, love, mercy, the giver of life, the fulfillment of life. In essence, all those things that make life beautiful and meaningful. And this means for us as people of faith, without worship, all of life becomes profane. But with worship, all of life becomes sacred. A look into the meaning of the word profane and its first cousin, profanity, helps us understand this commandment. Profane is a word that comes out of the Latin pro, which means in front of or outside of. And fano, meaning temple. In other words, there are words that we do not use in worship and in church. And we all know what they are. But the Bible makes it very clear that everything we do in life is worship, in that every thought and action either honors God or does not honor God. So what we do and say in our homes and our highways, the grocery store, the workplace, with respect to the name of God is very important. And you know, the Israelites worried so much about this using the Lord's name as though it didn't matter, that they would not even say God's revealed name, revealed to Moses what his name was. They wouldn't use the revealed name of Yahweh. Instead, they would say Adonai, which means Lord. And what it really means is when they use Adonai, it's you know who I'm talking about, don't you? But we can't use his name. In fact, Orthodox Jews to this day are so anxious about using the Lord's name as though it has no significance that any manuscript or holy object with God's name on it, Yahweh, cannot be thrown in the garbage, but it has to be buried in a geniza, a container which is normally buried in a Jewish cemetery. But all printed words of that nature, of Yahweh, have to be buried. This profound respect for God's name is a strategy of resistance against eliminating God's honor and glory and reducing God to be a pocket God, a co-pilot God, an armchair God, the God of our fondest wishes, or an irrelevant God. 
So the center of gravity in this third commandment is not so much the use of God's name, but which we see all over the Psalms and in the rest of the Bible, but it is the misuse of God's name that matters. And the commonly heard expression in the third commandment, in vain, simply means useless, for no purpose, without meaning, meaning, or without significance. Many observant and conservative Jews today do believe in putting a hyphen when they use the word God in English. They put a hyphen between the G and the D as a sign of respect for the holiness of God. And in our Bibles, you will notice that whenever Lord is written, it's often in all caps, isn't it? And it's to carry through that sense of respect that we are to give God's name. Now, to understand the power of a name, just think about your own name and what it means to you. I communicate regularly with many Cuban Presbyterians because of the years of partnerships I had with Cuban Presbyterian congregations. And because they don't have the money to pay for email, which is not free in Cuba, the main way I communicate with them is through Facebook. Well, about a year ago, I received an urgent, friend, uh, urgent message from my friend, Andres, saying that I needed quickly to change the password on my Facebook because somebody was pretending to be me and asking Facebook friends in Cuba and elsewhere to donate money for a mission in Nigeria. Well, Cubans are some of the poorest people in the hemisphere, and to defraud them just felt so predatory and wrong, and even worse, that it was done in my name. I was upset. I was humiliated. And that's because names matter. Now, when I was growing up, there was no swearing in my family. I did not come from a Christian family by any means. But words such as golly, gosh, gee whiz, were commonplace and regarded as appropriate and acceptable. And I never knew, honestly, I never knew, and was shocked to learn from my son-in-law who grew up in the Assemblies of God Church that those words are absolutely prohibited because they're like swear words. Gosh replacing God and gee whiz replacing Jesus Dang replacing damn, maybe? I don't know. (laughs) Great concern here. At Camp Longhorn, a Christian camp in the heart of Texas where one of my granddaughters attended for several years, there's a dam at the end of the lake where all the kids go swimming, and they call it the darn. (laughs) Great concern here. But I think said with tongue-in-cheek. Gosh, golly gee, they did not teach me about these words in seminary. I had no idea. And my grandchildren in town still are not permitted to say these words. But golly, I may be, whoops, (laughs) sorry. (laughs) I may be a lost cause, but I'm trying to break the habit for them. Seriously, however, scholars are in agreement that the greatest concern about the third commandment is not the popular Christmas song, Oh, by gosh, by golly, it's time for mistletoe and holly. Rather, it is the matter of making oaths, keeping promises, telling the truth. In the courtroom, we swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and then we say, so help me God. We hear people say, I swear to God, as though to say adamantly that they're telling the truth. And interestingly, the Jewish study Bible translates the third commandment this way, you shall not swear falsely by the name of the Lord your God. We can see several other prohibitions like this, especially in Numbers and Leviticus, great concern about oath-taking. 
the fundamental concern, the fundamental idea of swearing falsely is not breaking a promise. Jesus discussed this very issue in his Sermon on the Mount when he said, again, you've heard it You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, all you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. In other words, be a person of your word. Old timers used to say, my word is my bond. I haven't heard that lately. But let your yes mean yes, and let your no mean no. And here's the penetrating question for me. Am I willing to keep a promise even if it costs me something to do it? And BTW, what about OMG? That three-letter expression that's everywhere. Is it just innocent pop culture, or is it blasphemous? Watch any episode of ABC's Extreme Makeover Home Edition, and you will hear as the couple enters the remodeled house. I don't know if you've ever watched this program. Oh, my God. As they enter each room of their newly remodeled house. And last weekend, I was at the Tacoma Mall, and heard two young girls exclaiming OMG while looking at a bright red skimpy dress. And one day I asked my Arizona granddaughter who's entering college this year, what is it you mean exactly when you say OMG while you're looking at a fabulous prom dress? And she said, it just means wow. I said, so are you actually talking to God? She hesitated and said kind of sheepishly, no, not really. And I didn't say anything because sadly she does not go to church. And I was fearful of sounding like the proverbial church lady on Saturday Night Live. But that third word, do not use the Lord your God's name as if it were of no significance, did kind of float through my mind. You see, here's my concern. When the language we use about God becomes separated from the living God, I fear that the role of God in our lives will wither and die. Cussing and using scatological language. If you don't know the word scatological, I can't tell you here in the sanctuary. It may not have been envisioned in the third commandment, but here's one thing I do know. Foul and profane language is almost invariably combative, aggressive, and contrary to the ethic of Jesus and the sense of the sacred and the dignity of human beings. This last week, there was a lot of buzz about a new book entitled The Man Who Broke Capitalism by David Gellis. This book chronicles the rise and fall of General Electric under and after the leadership of CEO Jack Welch. David Gellis interviewed many people who worked with Jack Welch, Many of them said that when he came into a room, it was like a herd of elephants. And when they began to describe Jack Welch to David Gellis, some even still shook and paled. He was nicknamed Neutron Jack. After the neutron bomb, which was designed to save buildings but kill people. Gellis chronicles Welch's campaign to vaporize hundreds of thousands of jobs, to boost profits, altering the books to make it look like they were profitable, eviscerating the country's manufacturing base, destabilizing the middle class. And Welch's obsession with downsizing 
He purposely eliminated 10% of his workforce every year out of principle. Fundamentally, he fundamentally altered GE and inspired generations of imitators. But here's what caught my eye, my ear in the interview. I heard it just a few days ago with the author, David Gillis. He said, Welch used foul language and was predictably profane. So profane that Gillis said he couldn't give examples on the radio. And one election night when Welch sat with his own employees in the studio of NBC, which he had bought that station, he called them a foul name. And I bet you can guess what it is. We may be drawn to big, powerful, aggressive men or people like Jack Welch, but he was fundamentally dehumanizing. And that's what foul language does. It turns what is sacred and beautiful, and that means us who are made in God's image, into something raw, base, and degrading. And that's why the Apostle Paul wrote, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. I want to conclude with the most demanding and most important interpretation of the third commandment. And I've saved the hardest for the last. And here we come to the real heart of the matter about using God's name in vain. The English philosopher John Stuart Mill wrote long ago that language is the light of the mind. Everything we say about God either makes God greater than we are or smaller than we are. And what we really think and believe about God shows in the way we speak. Linguists know that the way we speak influences the way we see the world and science confirms the tremendous power of our words and the power they have on our minds. We think that the brain is controlling our words, but the evidence is that the words are controlling the brain. The words we speak not only reflect but shape our thoughts. Our thoughts are actually changing our brains. And all of this suggests that we need to be deliberately thoughtful about our words, which in turn become our thoughts. Joan Chittister, a Benedictine nun, states in her book on the Ten Commandments that the worst offenders of God's name are really religious people. And that is because, she says, the heart of the Third Commandment is that God's followers should not use God's name to do anything that God would never do. Apartheid in South Africa was an institutionalized system of discrimination and oppression against black South Africans. By whites, of course. And what's most distressing is you know where apartheid started? It was in the Calvinist church of the Dutch colonizers. And when the National Party in South Africa came to power in 1948, the manifesto claimed that the policy of apartheid was, quote, separation on Christian principles of justice and reasonableness. That, my friends, is the worst violation of the name of God in Jesus Christ. 
Many religious people dogmatically state that they know the mind of God. It starts early with children, even in some Sunday schools, thankfully I don't think ours, with phrases such as, God doesn't like little girls who, or God punishes little boys who, followed by the appropriate scripture, quoted to prove a point. And the worst offense, Chittister said, is using God's name to justify killing, harming, or hurting other people that we ourselves would like to scare, harm, or hurt, or do in. When an unreligious person commits evil, it doesn't bring God into disrepute. But when religious people, when Christian people commit evil in God's name, they are not only committing evil, they are doing damage to the very name of God. And this is, Chittister says, the reason why the violation of the third commandment is regarded as such a grave sin. So I want you and me together to think about our words and how we use them. Do they heal as God heals? Or do they hurt which God does not do? God wants to be involved with us. That is his character. That is his name. Let us pray. O oh God, our Father, hallowed be thy name. Holy be thy name. We do so want to reflect your light and love in all we do and say. Our most fervent hope is that others will come to know us, and then because of who we are and how we are and how we speak, then we will be drawn to you. In the name of Jesus, help us in this task. Amen.